Hello and welcome to the LLG Grapevine podcast. You're listening to Helen McGrath, LLG's Executive Director of Policy and Governance, and Dennis Hall, LLG Bulletin Editor. Hey everyone. Dennis, I'm getting excited about the Spring Conference. I understand you'll be joining us this year. Well, indeed. And of course, Leeds is a great choice of city centre venue. And the programme is once again very attractive. Certainly is. Now, let's get on with it. Ofsted is back in the news, Dennis. It is. And what happens at Ofsted is something that interests all of us, either for the interests of our children or grandchildren. Their school teachers and their school deserve more respect than they've had under their regulatory scheme. Recent changes suggest Ofsted, however, has now been listening. Here's the story. Ofsted is to display each of the sub-judgments awarded to an individual school alongside its overall grade at the top of its inspection report webpage. This change implemented on the 10th of May will mean parents are able to see a more rounded picture of a school, including the quality of education, its leadership and management, its approach to behavior and attitudes, and how it supports personal development. The school's watchdog said that it will now publish sub-judgments for all past and future graded school inspections carried out under the Education Inspection Framework, which launched in September 2019. The inspection report website will also display the sub-judgment for any early years or sixth form provision at a school. Last month, the watchdog published an updated policy for making complaints about inspections, which aims to handle providers' concerns more fairly, thoroughly and efficiently. The new process allows providers to seek a review of their inspection, including the conduct of inspectors and the judgments reached by submitting a formal complaint when they receive their draft inspection report. Ofsted Chief Inspector Sir Martin Oliver said, Parents are now able to see all a school's sub-judgments without having to open its full report. And this will help them see a more rounded, contextual picture of how well a school is doing and how it might work for their child. I hope, he said, that this change shows that we have listened to parents and teachers and that while our big listen consultation continues until the end of the month, we're acting where we can right now. This change is a small but important step in helping parents get more from Ofsted's inspection reports. Ofsted's Big Listen consultation runs until the 31st of May. Well, I wonder whether Offlog might take a leaf out of Ofsted's book in that regard. Now, elsewhere, the Department for Leveling Up Communities and Housing have written to chief planning officers of local planning authorities, providing guidance on various aspects of the planning system. It provides an update on reforms to the nationally significant infrastructure projects and the key guidance documents that have been published to help explain the changes that have been made. It advises that there will also be further new and updated guidance published in autumn of this year and winter. Meanwhile, the Environment Agency has teamed up with the Town and Country Planning Association to offer a suite of online training resources on planning for flood risk. Courses are free and aimed at planners and flood risk professionals working in the public sector. Other highlights include updates on statutory guidance around second staircases and the progress on implementing build-out measures for planning permissions. Views are also sought on how authorities will oversee locally-led urban development corporations and responses to this should be submitted by the 5th of June. One of the elements I just want to give a bit of time to here is that relating to recruiting in the sector. We do know that planners are difficult to recruit and retain, and the government has been supporting councils to do this through an organisation called Public Practice. So Public Practice, who are not-for-profit, work with local authorities to identify gaps in the capacity of planning and placemaking teams and match skilled mid-career professionals to local government jobs. To date, they have supported 96 authorities in filling 351 roles. The government states that public practice understand the resourcing challenges 
and have recently launched a curated jobs board to support authorities in recruiting senior level built environment professionals. With continued support from DLUC, public practice has expanded its recruitment services across England and their flagship associate programme for mid-career professionals is now embedded across England with the latest window for authorities to recruit through the programme open until the 30th of May. For support with recruitment or to find out more about public practices recruitment services, visit Hire for Public Sector, and that's at publicpractice.org.uk. Just a warning here, there are a lot of companies with similar names, so be sure to follow that website link exactly. Now the days, we return to a regular feature in the grapevine, that of data protection. Well, yes, because data breaches in the public sector are all too common. But here's the question, what do you do if it happens and how do you advise? Here's some snap guidance from the Information Commissioner's Office. If you think you've had a data breach, perhaps an email has been sent to the wrong person, a laptop was stolen from a car, or you've lost files because of a flood, and you're worried about what to do next, this seven point checklist can help. Step one, don't panic. It's understandable if you're concerned about what happens next, but the ICO say that they're here to help you understand what happened and to prevent it happening again. And not every breach reported to them results in formal action. Their main aim is to provide advice to help the organizations avoid similar incidents in the future. Step two, start the timer. By law, you've got to report a personal data breach to the ICO without undue delay and within 72 hours. You might even end up not needing to report it, but start a log anyway to record what happened, who was involved, and what you're doing about it. The clock starts from when you discovered the breach, not when it actually happened. Step three, find out what happened. Pull the facts together as quickly as possible. In your log, write down facts about the incident as you uncover them. This could be things like what happened and why, how many people were involved, a timeline of when it all happened, and what actions you've taken so far. Step four, try to contain the breach. Your priority is to establish what happened to the personal data affected. If you can recover the data, do so immediately. Also, you should do whatever you can to protect those who will be most impacted. If it's been sent to someone by mistake, you could ask them to delete it, send it back securely, or have it ready for you to collect. If you don't know where it is, retrace your steps. And if you think it's been lost in an office or building, you could try calling the reception. You could contain a cyber incident by changing all passwords and making sure your staff also do the same. Step five, assess the risk. You should now assess what you feel the risk of harm is to those affected, whether it's your customers, members, or service users. By risk of harm, we mean any potential harm or detriment it may cause to people, for example, safeguarding issues identity theft or significant distress. You might be dealing with a simple mix-up where there's little or no risk involved or a serious breach that will have a lasting effect on people's lives. Step six, if necessary, act to protect those affected. If possible, you should give specific and clear advice to people on the steps they can take to protect themselves and what you're willing to do to help them. And if you don't think there's a high risk to the people involved, you don't have to let them know about the incident itself. And now that you've established what happened, try to contain the breach and assess the risk of harm to those who have been affected, your next step is to do what you can to protect them further. Finally, step seven, submit your report if needed. If the breach is reportable, you can report it to the ICO online. And if you're unsure if your breach is reportable, you can also use the ICO self-assessment tool to help you decide, or you can call their personal data breach advice line. All these details are on their website. Well, all local authorities should have a very clear policy in place. So it's worth making sure that your data protection officer um, your HR department and your IT department all coordinate in relation to a policy on that and of course then um, in, involve a legal. 
Now, I want to turn to the Office for National Statistics, who have published public opinions and social trends in Great Britain between the 24th of April to the 6th of May. Now, these are quite interesting. Around six in 10, that's 58% of adults, agreed strongly or uh, simply agreed with the statement that elections in the UK are fair and democratic. Interestingly, this proportion was higher among men at 66% compared with women at 51% and among adults aged 70 years and over compared with other age groups. When asked about what issues, if any, people were most concerned about when thinking about the process of the next general election, commonly reported issues were the spread of misinformation and fake news at 64%, bias in the media, which has now gone over 50% at 54%, foreign influence on UK election results at 35%, the need for voters to present ID at 19%, electoral fraud, now that's interesting, at 18%, and then finally the safety of candidates who run for election at 15%. Frankly, my opinion is that should be higher. Now, the office asked about what people felt were important issues facing the UK today. And unsurprisingly, the most commonly reported issues were the cost of living at 89%, the NHS at 88%, and the economy at 70%. And these, by the way, have been the top three issues reported by adults since, since October 2022. That hasn't changed. Other commonly reported issues were housing at 64%, climate change in the environment at 60%, crime at 60%, and immigration at 56%. The proportion of adults reporting housing as an important issue has increased since the office first started asking about this in October 22, and that's gone up from 53% in the period uh, between October and November in 22 to 64% in the latest period. Now, the office also asked about people's experiences of the cost of their housing payments in more detail. And among those who pay rental mortgages, around four in 10 reported their rental mortgage had gone up in the last uh, six months. And this proportion remains higher than when the office first asked about this in March 22. And around a third reported it was difficult to afford their rental mortgage payments in the last period. And this proportion remains higher than when they first asked about this in March 22. So I don't think there are any surprises in there, Dennis, but it's really interesting to capture the mood of the nation. Now, something else in the news, Dennis, is procurement. Yes, indeed, procurement is, is in the news. The government commercial function has published a national procurement policy statement setting out these strategic priorities and commercial teams will be particularly interested in the detail behind the strategy. Here's more on this. The government commercial function has published a national procurement policy statement setting out the strategic priorities for public procurement and how contracting authorities can support their delivery. Last month, the government published the guidance, transitional and saving arrangements, which provides guidance on the arrangements which determine how contracting authorities are affected and should manage the changeover from previous legislation to the Procurement Act 2023. The statement, which will come into effect on the 28th of October this year, alongside introduction of the new Procurement Act 2023, covers value for money, social value, and small and medium enterprises. It also covers commercial and procurement delivery and skills and capability for procurement. The government commercial function said all contracting authorities must have regard to the statement as mandated by section 13 of the Procurement Act. And the statement applies to contracting authorities defined in section two, with the exception of the authorities and procurements set out at section 13, subsection 10. And these include private utilities, those contracts awarded under a framework or dynamic market, procurements under devolved Welsh procurement arrangements or to devolved Welsh authorities. And all of the detail is in the current. Thank you, Dennis. Now, finally from me, taken from the LGA Bulletin, 
Only two thirds of councils providing adult social care say they are confident of meeting all legal duties next year, according to an LGA report to coincide with the 10th anniversary of the Care Act. This is despite eight in 10 forecasting, having to cut spending on key community services like parks, libraries and leisure in order to top up underfunded adult social care departments. Councillor David Fothergill, who's the chairman of the LGA's Community Wellbeing Board, was interviewed by ITV News uh, the other week and said that due to underfunding, people will be receiving less visits, they'll be receiving shorter visits, and carers will be on tighter timetables. The LGA has called for urgent financial help to support the sector and help to recruit social care staff. And given the fallout from the Times newspaper's use of off-leg data, I found an interesting mention in the LGA brief on the funding of local authorities and services provided, which states that following the local elections, Paul Johnson, director of the Institute for Fiscal Studies, has written about the, quote, opaque system of local government funding. Now, he said that the problem for local democracy is that there is now little relationship between the council tax rates in a local area and what the relevant authorities are able to deliver. And that's because, he says, the way in which the central grants are allocated has become essentially arbitrary. Under those circumstances, it is hard for voters to have a real sense of how effective their local council is. And on that note, you can read more on the items discussed today and many more besides by going to bulletin number 17, available on the LLG website now. So it's goodbye from me. And from me too.